Sorry for the delay right there. My DJing skills were off uh, off point for a second. I didn't even notice. <laughs> didn't notice it at all. Um, so the portal, man. So here's what's happening with the portal. So as as everybody knows, we've got a um, high school promotion service uh, at myfootballcamps.com slash D1, where high school football players who are under the radar or need exposure can, um, you know, purchase a program for us where we'll get your name out there, you know, and, and, you know, to the point of, you know, different levels of success, you know, whether it's like getting you in front of coaches and getting, you know, on campus visit invitations to getting scholarships to, kids with scholarships already who are looking for more. We got a couple of guys like that who already have power five offers, but are looking for more Um, Two players who have moved like our, our our buddy Ben Hartman who moved from Texas to Oregon and kind of gets displaced in the system, you know, who's doing very well against three-star kids in Oregon, but isn't getting, you know, the interest that he deserves. Um, And honestly, what, what I think is going to happen with some kids is if you don't get what you're looking for, you're going to get intrigued. Uh, you're going to be intriguing to prep schools and JUCOs. I know a couple of kids in our program that have been reached out to by, you know, pretty good JUCO programs or pretty good prep school programs, um, you know, about doing an additional year there uh, so they can transition. So I think that's going to happen as well. So, you know, a lot of stuff going on, but the portal itself has become a monster. Um, so the FCS, as you could tell, FCS portal started and it opened at the end of the regular season. So it's been about a week and the feral portal feed has been insane, you know, keeping up with all the FCS kids entering and the interest that they're getting. And some of them are entering and this is D2 as well. And D3, uh, we had a D2 kid who's already got eight power five offers D2. Um, so again, if you go from high school to the promotion package to a D2 school, you can get to where you want to be if you're successful at the level. Um, but now next Monday, a week from today, the, the actual FBS portal opens. Um, and the kids with lost coaches, Wisconsin, Nebraska, you know, Cincinnati just recently with Luke Fickle, they can enter any time after their coach leaves. Uh, but the other kids who have been waiting for a very long time, you know, waiting for the regular season end, waiting for the conference championships games to be played, can enter next Monday. And they're going to need help. So we got a promotion package at the same time website, which Dave is going to pop up actually when we get off this, uh, allowing you to get promotion for your abilities as a transfer student. And to me, we didn't do it last year because it wasn't, the portal was kind of all over the map, but now with the 45 day window of the portal, you're going to need it. Um, If you get offers immediately, you don't need it. But if you're a guy who gets in that portal, and he's looking for schools to notice you, you're going to need this this uh, promotion package. Yeah, because outside of the guys that are picked up immediately right away, you're going to be caught in a situation where you have to differentiate yourself, and this is to be something that can really differentiate yourself. You need people to be able to take notice, um, and it's kind of a quick jump start to your process immediately because you got to get it back out of the portal as quickly as you can, um, so this will help you to accelerate that process. Um, it'll be up today, myfootballcamps.com slash D1 for promotion. Although, obviously, the high school stuff is already up there. Um, you're welcome to click on, click on the other programs until they're up there, but we'll have the transfer portal specific one up today. And, um, like, the value of getting Mike and myself to help be able to promote you over this time span is going to be critical. And um, and Mike runs the portal. Mike ru- runs the Faro portal. So who better to be able to to get your get your name out? There's someone that I intricately knows uh, all the people that are coming in and out of the portal right away. So check out myfootballcamps.com slash D1. Uh, high school guys obviously are um, – it was interesting you brought up Ben Harmon because I just did another one. He, I'll tell you, he's an animal, dude. Like he, his punch is great. I feel like Ben Hartman, I saw he, he went to visit Oregon State, um, I think it was last week, so they brought him in there, 
and um, you know to watch a game. I don't know if it was this this past game or it was the week four, but they brought him in, and schools are going to keep you know bringing him in. Um, you know, it'll be interesting to see see where he falls. I I, I tell you, interior wise, though, he actually showed on film just this year alone playing tackle, guard, and center. They're basically plopping him around wherever they need to, where they got to run the ball. Obviously, with his size and physicality, um, and he was an all league performer. And I don't, I, I think he got there after like week two, right, or week three. Yeah, in mid season. Yeah, and he ended up being an all league performer. Obviously, he was. Uh, an important part of what 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 was you know going on there. So this is a guy that um, I think is he's going to get a spot. It's going to be it's going to be where and how much he gets. But um, but that's what the promotion is about. I mean he he was uprooted, you know, at family situation, uprooted to had to go back to Oregon uh, from te- obviously he was from Lake Travis, so football rich Lake Travis. Um, to Oregon, smaller school. He he. Uh, thank goodness he's he's with us. You know what I mean? Because he could he could it could be a more difficult situation for him. But he's an example of a fantastic player that that yeah the help and is getting it. And uh, you know, with him, it's going to be up to him whether he wants to go you know to the D two level, or if somebody comes in on him late FCS. Uh, or if he wants to do, you know, what I mentioned earlier is the prep or, or JUCO. So the good thing about this is, you know, West Coast and Central United States is JUCO and, and even down Southeast. East Coast is prep. You know, I mean, you and I have obviously dealt with, you know, coaches at the Hun School, um, you know, Avon Old Farms, uh, Cheshire, Worcester Academy of Massachusetts, all these excellent prep schools where you can get a fifth year uh, and get additional exposure. Um, you know, or you could go the JUCO route, you know, and, and everybody says the JUCO route's dead because of the portal. It's not. I know schools that are actually hammering the JUCO route more than the portal simply because that's their preference. There's a difference between preference. Some people want a college kid who's college ready. Um, but with that comes a reason they're in the portal. Not everybody's Caleb Williams who could jump in the portal and just command, you know, whatever the best offer is for NIL. Most of the kids are in there for a reason, whether it's playing time or off field issues or homesickness, or there's always something. Uh, Juco is the same way. And some people really like the Juco way uh, more so than they like the portal way. So Juco's aren't dead, but, but with a kid like that is a good example of someone who's got options now, and he asked me, he goes, do you know any, you know, prep schools? Well, of course I do. I know everybody at the prep. I, I, I haven't really checked lately to see who the coaches are uh, at the prep schools, but I know they're the same dudes or a lot of them are the same guys that have been there forever. Um, you know, there's a Billy Chaplick up at Milford Academy. He's still at Milford Academy. I, I think Danny O'Day is, used to be at the Hunt and think he's somewhere in Connecticut now. On and on. You know, the guy who was up at Worcester, I think, is at Cheshire now. So we know these guys, and we'll certainly give them your name, and they'll contact you and see if you want to go the prep route. You know, in a perfect world, we would be able to place you or get you placed at a level you're satisfied with. But if there is a situation where it's not a level you're satisfied with and you feel that you're better than that and you can go on to a one-year stop at a JUCO or a prep school, this is going to help you with that too. Because promotion is promotion, and people knowing who you are is always very important. Uh, for him, I think it's definitely a situation of having to move. I think, you know, obviously you get on the radar as a freshman or a sophomore, and that's how high school recruiting works. Then if you have a good junior season, you can bust through a little bit. But if you have a junior season, which is solid, but then you have to move during your senior season, you can easily just get lost. And that's why this promotion keeps him alive. I just retweeted the one you did. He sent me his senior film. I'm doing a couple this week as well. And we're just going to keep hammering it out there, you know, until you get what you want. The the portal's different. You know, we were talking off camera about we have a time frame for the high school. You know, you can buy the one time. You could buy the six month. You could buy the 12 month. A 2024 kid right now, we're not really taking any 2023s anymore. There's time. We've got ourselves a full year. Um, 
you know, so you can, you know, lock into a time frame where I think you should do a six month. I should think you should do the 12 month, you know, 2026, you should definitely do the 12 month. Um, but with the portal, yeah, it's time sensitive and you got to find a spot. And I've been talking to a lot of colleges about roster management and, and to your point, that feral portal, you should see how many coaches are signing up for that thing and signing up. I mean, it's just following it. It's free. Right. Coaches on a daily basis, like every, and I'm talking from, you know, FCS schools you never heard of to freaking Oklahoma. They're all on there. Uh, they're, they're also a lot of them reaching out to me and, and the guy I call portal Jesus, Mark Pashonik, who, you know, obviously very well, who yep. runs that page for me, um, that, that social media handle for me, they're reaching out and they're all like, Hey, you know, do you have a list of the top quarterbacks in the portal? Because they don't have enough staff for this stuff. Honestly, you'd think college football programs have endless money and enough staff to track this. But what the colleges are doing right now is they're tracking high school recruiting. They're tracking the portal. They're re-recruiting their own guys to keep them out of the portal, which is a, a that's work in itself. Um, yep. They're, they're track, tracking JUCO because the JUCO signing day is coming up soon. Um, they're also tracking to see who's going to leave for the NFL. And roster management right now if you have a program which has 85 scholarships, you could be a coach, and I know many of them right now, who could be looking at, I may have 25 scholarships available, like in the spring, you know, so I got to bring in what, you know, maybe 20 kids out of high school, five out of the portal. I may have 40. Like Brian Kelly, what he did at LSU, he, he, his roster scholarship level, I believe, was down to 49 players when he took over which is amazing, but that's the portal. There was a coaching change. A lot of kids left. There was no one there to bring kids in. His roster was decimated at 49 and he built it up through the portal and through recruiting with a big recruiting class, big portal. They don't know what to do right now. They have no idea whether they're going to have 49 kids on their roster or 60 kids on their roster. So the point of this is that if you're a recruit, jumping in the portal looks great, but Sometimes people are going to have to wait and see what numbers they have. And by waiting, I mean, we're going to have to figure this out in January or even February after the late signing period and the, the NFL declaration period. And they may have more scholarships than they thought or less. If they have more, then they're going to be looking at the portal. If they have less, you could be out of luck. So what you're going to need at that point is somebody who's promoting you uh, constantly. So, you know, I think it's a, it's a, interesting business um i know my future when it comes to a business uh, people like what i say about college football they respect what i say about recruiting because i've been doing it for so long but they crave the information we provide when it comes to transfers that's the yeah. one thing they crave more than anything else um and that's where we can help you because that five it's 5,300 followers right now. We built up the old one. I won't mention whose it is to 80, 85,000. We did yeah. that in two years. We added 80,000. This 5,300 is going to be by the spring 30,000. And then by next year at this time, we're going to be over 80,000 followers on that portal feed. And we're going to be the Kings of the portal. Um, and we're just starting to see that right now. I got a random text from somebody today saying, your feral portal is being mentioned in every message board and every article that I see out there in regards to the portal. And this is just the start. So it's a great place to promote yourself. And eventually I know that one's going to be, <laughs> that one's going to become very, very hard to juggle because there's nothing harder. You asked me the other day, which was kind of funny, you know, how do you get access to the portal? It's impossible. And, and I won't get into the details as to why it's impossible. I explained to you why it's impossible. You have to know people and you have to know them for years and years and years and build up their trust to get access to that portal. Cause the NCA has made it very, very hard. Um, but I know a way. <laughs> when you know, if you know, well, a way. It's, it's a pain in the ass. I mean, I told you how, yeah. Can you imagine managing that? I, I, on the inside, managing that every day, you got to do that. Every sometimes every few hours, 
every few hours. It logs you out. If you're not active in there, you know how, I don't know if you gamble, right? But, you know, if you're in DraftKings or FanDuel yeah, and you're yeah. doing your stuff, if you're idle for like five minutes, it logs you out. And it's for your own protection. And then what it is, you have to log in and then it sends you a second tier authentication, blah, blah, blah. It could be every couple hours. That's oh. why nobody has access to it and it's impossible to keep access to it. So, again, it's a, it's a, I'm not going to tell you how I do it. It's a trick of the trade, whatever. But it's something that I think is invaluable, um, you know, to my business, to what we write and all that stuff. And, and because of that, the page is growing. So if you want a promotion of your abilities, there's no better place, even though I've got 5,300 followers on that feral portal compared to some other places that have 80,000. Well, one other place that we built up to 80,000. Trust me when I tell you, you're going to get more eyeballs on this one because this is the one that's hot. This is the one that everybody's paying attention to. This is the one that's growing exponentially and quick. Um, so there's my pitch. Yeah, it's it's, it's incredible. I mean, I'm, I'm actually looking at it. It, it. it has how you have all the information on there. I mean, yeah, there are others that are copying it, no doubt about it. I see that. Um, well, you know what he does that's different? And this is his genius, and this is why I call him Portal Jesus. Um, he he tracks not only kids that enter. So entering the portal is, you know, it's right in front of you. You can see it. Kids that say they're going to enter because they can't enter. Okay? So grad transfers can enter. So this Tulsa quarterback, Davis Brin, that's on our feed, grad transfer. He can answer right away. Uh, Cincinnati kids, now that Fickles announced he's leaving, they can ent enter right away. And the Wisconsin and Nebraska kids had the 30-day window after their coach left or was fired. Um, but there's a window for everybody else. So what happens is after the end of the season, we got like three Texans A&M kids as an example who announced that they're going to enter the portal. He tracks that, and I don't know how he finds it. Like – you know, looking at something and seeing somebody's in something is one thing, but how the hell do you find kids that are going to say they're going to be in it, but they're not in it yet? That's what he does. The other thing he does that's amazing is he tracks the offers. So a kid enters, you know, Indiana State transfer defensive back Bilal Cohn got an offer from Akron. That's on our feed. You're not going to get that anywhere else. You're not going to find out who's offered who and what. You're just not. And that's what the genius of, of, of he, you know, his obsession with the portal is. And that's the differentiator. You can go on the other portal feeds and you'll just get like this kid entered the portal. You, on our feed, you're going to get everything else, which is insane. It's really, really good information. So that's why it's growing so fast. Right. These guys got offers and stuff like that. And uh, it, it, it's interesting. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm on it right now just looking at it. And how, um, first of all, how many guys are in there? It's incredible. Well, it's going to get, uh, next Monday is the FBS when they can really go in. There's going to be roughly about 2,000 kids in that 40 day, 45 day window entering the portal. 2,000 kids. It's, it's incredible. I, I, incredible. I mean, I, it, that's like becoming the main recruiting spot for college coaches now. Yeah, so they're juggling high school versus that. You know, high school is a lot easier because you know a high school kid's good from his eighth grade or freshman year or from our promotion or whatever, and you can get on him and, and take that long period of time to recruit him, and he can't sign until his senior year. So that's like the slow burn. This is your quick fix. This is, you know, U, USC was 4-8 and eight last season. Um, Lincoln Riley takes over. It's not because Lincoln Riley is a genius coach that they're now – 11 and one in the Pac-12 championship and possibly get into the portal. I mean, uh, to the, to the, to the uh, playoff. It's because he was able to fix that roster immediately, especially offensively with Caleb Williams, with Mario Williams, with Travis Dye, um, with Austin Jones, the backup running back that came in after Travis Dye got hurt uh, with Jordan Addison, the Belinknikoff winner. Um, you name it. That roster is made up of, I'd say 75% portal impact players and 25% kids who are on that roster. So you can go from four and eight to 11 and one. 
immediately with the right players. Um, so it's kind of like the quick fix, what you need now. And whereas the recruiting is the slow, long burn. So it's not as popular, but it's probably 50-50. It's interesting. We'll, we'll talk about recruiting. A um, couple of coaching changes that made a huge impact. Uh, well, will make a huge impact. Luke Fickle to Wisconsin and Matt Rule to Nebraska. Um, what are your thoughts on and uh, First of all, I think Matt Rule, I, you know, off the top of my head, I think the Matt Rule is probably a pretty good hire for Nebraska ju- just off his history of what he's done and what they need. I think that's a good one. I thought Luke Fickles was interesting because he basically had committed to building Cincinnati into a power, and then this year they were not quite as good. He, he realized, hmm, maybe I should – 10 and 2 is not bad. Yes, but you know, but yeah, he cashed out and he it was about time to do that. It, right. you know, to your point, I mean Matt Campbell should have done it years ago. And it's not that he's poor. I mean, he's making five million a year at Iowa State, but you gotta you gotta move when it when the time is right and, and the job is right and you're a hot commodity. Rule is great. Great. Um that's as good a hire as you can get because I thought Scott Frost was a great hire for Nebraska um, because I thought he was a former player. He's a legend there. You know, he's from, you know, he's, re- he was down in Florida so he could recruit Florida, bring kids up there. But I, I, the one question I have was whether he could coach or not. I didn't know, you know, he kind of fell into that perfect season <clears throat> and, and inherited a really good roster. And now we find out he can't coach not to that level to make them good. Matt Rule, we know, can coach. I, I don't have any expectations of recruiting four and five stars to Nebraska. That's not what he does. At Temple, he didn't do that. At Baylor, he didn't do that. But he's a de- player evaluator and developer, and that's exactly what's needed at, at Nebraska. So that's a home run to me. Um, Wisconsin's risky because Jim Leonard, obviously a Wisconsin guy, uh, you know, he was supposed to get the job as the defense coordinator and interim coach. All the players love him. Uh, and recruiting's kind of taken a little bit of a dip. There's going to be some guys like Braylon Allen, the running back, going to hit the portal. And Fickle better be successful. I think he's a great coach and a good fit, but to to, it's a really do- tough balance for them because Jim Leonard's the popular choice. Uh, Fickle's the better choice, but sometimes the popular choice keeps your roster together and doesn't set you back. If Fickle's the better choice but doesn't turn out to be a great coach, Wisconsin could really be setting themselves back. Very, it's very interesting. Um, and this obviously this is just just the beginning, and that le- leaps in the Auburn mess. I, I thought what was hilarious uh, uh, during the week, uh, obviously he's an outsider. If I was Lake Kiffin, I would have been frustrated with the whole thing. But I thought it was hilarious just how they were – coming at him about leaving, going to Auburn. They end up losing the Egg Bowl. He, he's, he's staying. Um, there was all this stuff I would watch about, like, these, like, I don't know. The only way I could call it is only Ole Miss and um, uh, Auburn fans would know the whole Tubby Tuberville situation with the, um, the Pine. The pine, uh, pine Box. Pine Box. So, you know, Blake Kiffin – Dropping like an Easter egg there on that, and um, uh, obviously that not being—it's almost being reverse pine box. They're saying now, um, but anyway, it's it's incredible. Auburn now didn't want Hugh Freeze, and you're going to touch on this, uh, or decided they want Hugh Freeze after a lot of talk that they were going to get Hugh Freeze. What becomes next, and and should they be going after Deion Sanders? I know Colorado is right. Um, well, what's the deal there at Auburn? I don't know what's next. I mean, those were the, it was funny because it's kind of a layup. It was like, if we don't get Kiffin, we're going to get Freeze because Hugh Freeze signed an extension with Liberty um, you know, for good money, $5 million at a, at a, they're independent, but technically a group of five level. Um, but, you know, the lure of coming back to the SEC West was would be too much. He would probably make $8 million at Auburn. So they figured that they, sh- they, they took their shot. And Jimmy Sexton's the agent for both of these guys. So they took their shot at Kiffin. Um, Kiffin didn't go. So they fe- felt that the backup would be freeze no problem. 
but then the boosters came in and they don't like his character, you know, which is funny. <laughs> because, well, I get it. You know, like these guys tried to force out Brian Har Harson by making up some sort of scandalous affair he had uh, and, and tried to smear his name and couldn't come up with any proof. But they tried to ruin the guy's life just to get him out of Auburn. Um, you know, so if they do care about that stuff, if they are r religious folks, what Hugh Freeze did at Ole Miss not exactly what they want. But listen, Liberty is a Christian school. Right. And they took them. So Auburn, holier than now attitude is kind of what I'm hearing is they've put, you know, they put freeze on the back burner. And now I don't know where they're going to go. I don't know who the hell they hire. Like they wanted rule. He was also one of the ones that they were interested in and they talked to and he ended up going to Nebraska. You know, Dion's not ready for that job. He's just not. I mean, he, you know, He's a big name. He would recruit well, but, you know, he's proven nothing. I mean, he's in Jackson State. Their roster is 10 times more talented than anybody they play. Um, you know, to, so to hand him the keys to a Power 5 program like Auburn, uh, he would be in over his head. So now what do they do? They go to Bill O'Brien, um, you know, who I don't think is a great hire. I thought this was going to be good for Auburn, that they were going to get one of their two top candidates, and now they're not. And I really don't know where. I mean, they should consider Cadillac um, staying there. I think he's done a really good job. I think he has a passion for Auburn as a former player, and I think he's proven that he can coach at that level. But they kind of, they kind of, they kind of screwed themselves here, you know, with with the way they've handled this, which is typical of Auburn. Um, and here's the other thing that they promised the new coach, right? This athletic director coming in, he's going to have full control over everything. There's a clause in his contract that says the boosters are not going to dictate what happens. What happened to Brian Harson? you know, the attempts to get rid of Gus Malzahn for the last five years, none of that's going to happen. This isn't a booster run program. This isn't a old money program. This is the new Auburn. And then boom, you know, the, the boosters immediately block somebody. Um, from being hired. So it's the same old story. So same it's really story. not an attractive job in that case. I mean, why would you go there if you're a big name coach just to struggle and get run out of town and potentially have your, uh, <laughs> potentially have your life ruined? Well, I think that's the big thing here is that Auburn botched it last time. <laughs> okay. It brought in Harson. They're botching it again. And, the coach that goes in there is could potentially just be in another Harson situation. And why would another guy want to put themselves through that? Right. Right. And I mean, um, that's amazing because it's, it's a cool, cool campus. It's got like, it's got a lot of stuff to it. It's, it, it's a big, obviously college town, but you know, when you have Alabama up the road and, the team that you're going to be compared to and you don't have all your ducks in a row um, and you're going to go in there as a head coach and they don't have all their ducks in a row. I don't know. I mean, it seems like, like are going to, are they going to be stuck with a second tier situation from who they hire? If they're stuck like that, they should just take Cadillac Williams. I agree with you. Cadillac Williams is already there and he is an alumni and he probably can navigate a little better, get a little bit of, uh, lead time. It could use a little bit of the, hey, I'm cleaning up the mess. T lead time uh, before he gets pressured on anything. I mean, what 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 else is going to be their option? And then with Dion, <clears throat> um, Colorado to me is interesting because it's so bad there. Like if if I were to take a job, being Dion and like saying where could I make an impact quickly continue to culture my reputation that I've built and get players that give me an advantage over the other comp competition, that is not a bad place because they're so bad that you could go in there and you start winning five or six or seven games. Um, and now they're like, oh, you're the greatest coach. I mean, he could probably go and dip into the portal to get some of what he needs just you know, almost immediately. I'm sure he would also. What is his son's el uh, his quarterback son's eligibility? Is he have one more say, year? He, yeah, no, he could play next year. He would um, instantly be the Colorado starting quarterback because their quarterback sucks. So, 
he would go with him. But first of all, fish out of water. I mean, you talk about Harson coming from the mountains down to Auburn. Dion yeah. coming from the southeast, you know, where he's an FSU legend. He played in Texas. He played in Atlanta. And he coaches in Mississippi to Colorado. No, it's not a fit. It wouldn't be a good decision. USF, great decision for him. Um, I think it's better job. I mean, they suck oh, too. Definitely. They went one and eleven. They're a horrible, horrible team. But he could recruit in Tampa, and he could build up his staff, and and then take the next step to Power Five. I think if he goes to Colorado, it's just sort of like a, you know, I mean, listen, Mel Tucker, <clears throat> Mel Tucker went to Colorado for one year, went I think what six and six, and got a ninety-five million dollar job eventually at Michigan State. So what do I know? I mean, maybe it's a good move. <laughs> To me, it doesn't seem like a good move. And and Mel Tucker is a Southeast guy, too. He was at Georgia, and, and he's got a lot of ties to the SEC. So maybe I'm wrong, uh, but I just don't think that's the right fit for Dion. But, again, I, they're not handing him the keys. The big name now that's emerged, of course, for, for Auburn is James Franklin, which he's a guy that's, you know, in every coaching search every year, um, some idiots are saying Dabo Swinney, which is hilarious to me because he would never in a million years go to, uh, I don't know even know why he's on the list, but I see him on all these lists. You know, he's an Alabama guy. He would never go and, and compete with Nick Saban at all. It's stupid. James Franklin, maybe he's been successful in the SEC at a much more difficult place. You know, he might be getting tired. He's a Pennsylvania guy. He loves Penn State, but maybe he's getting a little tired of the fact that he can't beat Ohio State and he can't beat Michigan. And that he's horrible in, in top 10 matchups and, and really worse in top five matchups. Um, he's, he's running third in his own division. Um, maybe he wants that challenge. I don't know. But I, I really don't know where they go. I mean, honestly, as you said, I mean, let's go Cadillac and give it a shot. I mean, if it doesn't work, give him a couple of years. You know, you don't have to roll out 80 million guaranteed like you would have to with Kiffin. Um, you know, or, or even Hugh Freeze wouldn't be guaranteed, but you'd be paying in the $8 million range. You don't have to do it with a Cadillac because he's unproven. Give him the job. If he doesn't work out in two years, then uh, move on. So, but they've really screwed themselves. Now, I don't think, I don't think this Freeze thing is dead. I, I think these boosters, you know, you remember the Shano thing at Tennessee and, mm. you know, which was stupid, you know, because, oh, my God, this guy was – at Penn State, when all that stuff happened with Sandusky, we don't want him hired. Well, the idiot boosters and fans and the Clay Travis dude down there, the big media talking head, well, great. You didn't get Shiano. Guess who you got? Jeremy Pruitt. And he sucked. And, and you're under NCAA investigation, and you're going to get hammered by the NCAA for paying recruits because of him. Now, Heupel's recovered. They're, they're good, even though they just got drilled um, you know, a week ago to South Carolina. But you could set yourself back – by letting the boosters and the fans dictate who you're going to hire. So I think, I think there's some discussions being had in Auburn right now that say, okay, we don't like this guy's character. We just don't. But he beat Nick Saban twice in a row. No one's ever done that at Alabama except for Hugh Freeze. Um, our drop-off from two down to three is a real, real bad one. Maybe we just overlook this 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 – holier than now approach and we roll the dice with Hugh Freeze. So I don't think it's dead with Hugh Freeze, but it's it shocked me because and this is what happens all the time and it annoys me quite a bit. You know, Kenny Dillingham is a guy that I text often, you know, um known him since he was at Florida State and before that he was at Auburn. And you know, he's Oregon offensive coordinator, you know, great, great job at Bo Nix, great job this season. He's 32 years old. I even pumped him out there for the Arizona State job. You know, said he would be a great fit. That's his school. He's got, he's got ties there. Guess guess who ghosted me this weekend? Kenny Dillingham. Um, ghosted. Text him like, so what's up with the Arizona State rumors? You know, what's happening here? Gets reported by a billion other people who talk to agents and, and athletic directors. Less sources than me. I talked to the guy himself. Ghosted. Hugh Freeze. Another guy I talk to a lot. Um, Saturday comes around. It comes out pretty much that Kiffin's not going to leave. He, you know, the Egg Bowl Thursday, Friday. By Saturday, it comes out he's not leaving. He's going to sign an extension. Hugh Freeze goes. Disappears. Haven't heard from him since. Sent him like three text messages. It happens all the time. It annoys the hell out of me. 
I know James Franklin very well. If I texted him and said, do you have any in interest in the Auburn job? I would get no answer. I wouldn't get a no. I wouldn't get a yes. You'd think after 20 years, I would get a between me and you because I wouldn't put it out there if it was off the record. I'll get nothing. Which segues into our next topic. Ryan Day, who I love to death, knew him for 25 years. But second he got that Ohio State job, he big time me. Big time. Oh, he big time me too. I knew him really well. Crazy. Really, really well. Meaning he would watch because he was recruiting some of my kids in school I was at at a quarterback. He ended up going to Villanova. He was looking at he was at Boston College at the time. And I was giving him New Jersey recruits for Boston College. And 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 he was signing those these kids. And um we would see, he would sit at the basketball game. We'd look at my player. He was like, I, I think he's uh probably FCS. And you know, but we would we'd hang out and and um and uh yeah, you know, once he got the job, he, he you know, I, I I sent him a message, you know, congratulations. He said thing, and then that was it, you know. Um but and, and you don't need to talk to him as much as I do, right? You're not in the everyday. No, I barely, really, I really, yeah. But I'm saying for me, you know, I, I he was a grad assistant at BC. Then he went on to be a grad assistant at Florida under Urban Meyer. Uh, then he, um, you know, came back as a as a full time coach at BC. Um, and then he was, you know, essentially the offensive coordinator. But he's a wide receiver coach. I would go up to BC. I covered BC forever. You know, that's my school since Flutie. I would go up and talk to him all the time. We would text all the time, all the time. And again, it's about recruiting. You know, what do you think of this kid? Blah, blah, blah. He would ask me questions. You know, I had a good conversation with him often. And then he got, you know, going off to the NFL. Um, and he came back and he was, you know, the offense coordinator under Urban at Ohio State. And that's when he started, like, not responding. And he got the head coaching job. Nothing. I, I you know. I, I think I sent him a happy birthday. He responded, thanks. You know, um, right. I've asked him a couple questions here and there. He's answered. Now, begrudgingly, he's done some interviews with me. On, uh, and I, I don't say begrudgingly, but he's been nice enough to do interviews with me. You know, uh, when I was at Rivals, you know, every signing day, it would be a big deal. They'd be like, okay, Mike, you got to get all your buddies on. You know, and by buddies, it's like, Nick Saban's not a buddy of mine, but you got to get Nick Saban. And I'm like, Jesus Christ, how am I supposed to get Nick Saban on a freaking, you know, Zoom recording with me? But I would do it. And Ryan would always do it. Now, he would push me to a sports information director. I would deal with that guy. That guy had us coordinate. But he'd always be gracious enough to give me 10 minutes. But when it comes to the contact we used to have, which was, you know, on a weekly basis at least, to where he was at Ohio State, Nothing disappeared zero. So I'm not a spiteful person. I'm just like this sucks, and it's happened before with many many coaches over it the years. So often it happens. They just and again I get it. They get busy. Um, yep. You know, being the Ohio State head coach, you're being pulled in 85 different directions. But you kind of have to remember who your buddies are. Like like Halfley does at BC. Good guy, right? Good guy. Never forgets where he's from. Um, I knew him when he was at Pitt. I knew him when he was at Rutgers. Um, went off to the NFL, became the defensive coordinator at Ohio State, head coach at BC. Never wavered. If I ever needed anything from that dude or if I needed a, a question answered, he would always respond immediately. Um, and we continue to talk to this day. Always remembers where he's been. Some other guys are like that too. But most of them, when they get big-time jobs, they move on and they – you know, big time. Yeah. And that's what kind of Ryan's done. And it's been disappointing to me. I don't need him to be my friend. You know, right. we were never friends, but we were certainly associates. Um, and, and we would, if I asked a question, he would answer. If he had a question or a need for me, I would give it to him in any way. And then it disappeared. So the reason for this long segue is it becomes difficult for me when somebody is nice like that, you know, BC sucked this year, right? I think they went three, three and nine. You know, they just got drilled by Syracuse. They were winning that game. You know, they got a lot of injuries. They're a young football team, but I have to write that they're a huge disappointment. I just have to. I can't like sugarcoat that. So it sucks because Jeff Hafferly, I consider a really good guy who stays in touch with me. Writing stuff like that sucks because he's going to get hurt by it and upset by it, I assume. Uh, and that happens with a ton of coaches. So now Ryan Day just lost the second time in a row to Michigan. People are very, very unhappy with him as the head coach in Columbus. 
and I have to write that. But I don't have any qualms writing it now because there's no there's no personal emotional tie dilemma for me. He's a stranger and he made it that way. So now I'm just gonna write. I'm not gonna go deeper on him than I would, but it's gone. So I think losing to Michigan twice in a row for the first time since 1999 and 2000, losing at home to Michigan for the first time that program's lost since 2000, he's been a kind of a disappointment. Well, here's what's interesting. So his record, I mean, he's lost like so few amount of games. It's some five games. Game. It's 45 and five. It's 45 and five. So his record is unreal. But it's one of these things where when Jim Harbaugh made that comment starting on third base, he didn't, Jim Harbaugh, even though he was taking a dig at Ryan Day, who took a dig at him, my thought process is like, Jim Harbaugh, who definitely look, he coached at San Diego State. He could, if anyone could have pulled rank earlier in his career, it, it could have been him. He was a pro quarterback. Um, he, you know, a, his a son of a coach, obviously who coached in college. But he went. He, he built up San Diego. You not San Diego State, right? San Diego of right. San Diego, who has not won before or since. Okay, and he he put him in the playoff, uh, FCS playoff, and then he went, obviously did it at Stanford. Obviously did it in the NFL. Uh, whether people like him or hate him, I'll, all I know is this: is this guy does things that has not been done at other places before, even places like Michigan, right? And so, what what he did, and <clears throat> with his quarterback throwing, because they always, you know, obviously everyone always. Michigan is a running team, which they're they're the backup running back and it ran for acres. But uh, the quarterback going and taking a quarterback, and Owen's always busting his chops. Oh, your quarterbacks don't throw for as many yards. Well, his quarterback lit it up and mm -hmm. and showed everybody that he could throw if if he needs to, he could throw it a million times and all over the yard. And um and that's what he did. But what was interesting to me is Ohio State defensively. And I think I've talked about this a couple of times with you, about the defenses they stay in. They sit in these defenses that are not conducive to being able to stop the pass. I, I've seen it against – who, who were they in the playoff with? Maybe it was Clemson. I can't remember. But so it they, was, they lost to Clemson one year and they lost to Alabama in the title game and arguably both games. And in similar ways, right? They they get they get guys and they have guys in the almost seems like the wrong spots playing the wrong people, and um, not you know one one game they were playing the run super hard against I think it was Alabama they just started throwing it all over the place on him, and he didn't have guys and then and so my thing with with Ryan Day's Ohio State is they don't play defense, they don't play defense, and. For for the Big Ten, they're better than most of the teams roster wise, which is why they continue to dominate. But when they with Maryland and um, to his brother exposed the week before, because I watched that whole game, he just running and throwing. I can't think of to his brother's name, but um, oh yeah, Talia, Talia. I mean, he threw all over the yard and and. And their players were making plays all over the place on them, but they had guys wide open too. It wasn't <clears> like it wasn't like he was just threading the needle and, and, and making these amazing throws, which he did make nice throws. But he had guys open and and open all over the place, and really should have won that game. It's just that Ohio State just had so much more talent, okay, that they were able to overcome it. And that's what I, I'm not sure about with Ryan Day. And it's it's hard to critic critic someone who's 45 and 5, but these are the things I see in games with teams with somewhat comparable players, you know? Yeah. And so what's interesting here is, <clears throat> you know, uh, Jeff Halfley, as I spoke of before, was, you know, the co-defensive coordinator in 2019 for them. And Kerry Coombs, who's a tremendous defensive back coach as well. And they were okay in 2019 defensively, but they did get exposed. Um, 2020 is COVID. Uh, so it's hard to really tell. You know, Coombs was, became the, uh, the defensive coordinator. 
And so he brings over Jim Knowles from Oklahoma State, who, who did a great job, you know, with Oklahoma State in the Big 12 and had one of the best defenses there. Nothing's changed, though. <clears throat> you know, people wanted Coombs out, and they thought he was a bad fit as a defensive coordinator. He doesn't know how to <clears throat> game plan. We're going to fix it with Knowles. You know, it hasn't been fixed. But the common denominator here is Ryan Day. He's the head coach. You know, it's on him to find somebody. Uh, and so far, he hasn't found somebody who could be that guy. Um, so defensively, they're very susceptible. Offensively, you know, you could argue quarterback development at Michigan, of course, because, you know, you really did not had a star. And J.J. McCarthy threw 24 passes. He was 12 and 24, three TDs. But, you know, he didn't sling it all over, and he never will. Jim Harbaugh doesn't play that way. Um, but you have to really look at Ryan Day is quarterback development too. And, and it sounds funny, right? Because, <clears throat> you know, Justin Fields was a great quarterback there, Heisman finalist. Dwayne Haskins was a great quarterback there. But there's an argument that could be made as passers, and they were system guys. And C.J. Stroud is clearly a system guy. Now, he's a top NFL draft pick, and everybody's drooling over him as a top 10 pick and all that stuff. But what I see is a guy in an offense – <clears throat> that sees one read stays on that and just has so much talent on that team that that first read is usually open. And if it's not, the second read's open. But if those first two reads are gone, <clears throat> he doesn't know what to do. Um, so it's really not a quarterback progression. I see Haskins was the same way. Justin Fields can run, and he's great in the NFL as a runner, but we're seeing the same thing, the lack of ability to make progressions. And so all these little flaws, if, if Ryan Day beat Michigan Saturday, none of these little flaws would come out. We wouldn't be talking about the defense and how it's struggling. We wouldn't be talking about the defense coordinators or his development of quarterbacks or offensive players. We wouldn't be questioning any of this stuff. But the dude's 45 and five. Two of those losses are in the playoff and they were bad losses. They got blown out both times. Two of those losses are to Michigan back to back. Unacceptable when you've dominated Michigan for all these years, he's under a lot of pressure on there. And they could still make the playoff. This is what's funny about college football. They're still a playoff contender as of today, you know, not playing another game, but the playoff rankings, you know, after the championship games this weekend, let's say Georgia's in, let's say Michigan's in. Um, and let's say TCU wins. That's three spots, but then you've got USC uh, they could lose, which would bump Ohio State right in there. They still have a chance to make the playoff. But yet we're talking about this guy like I've seen so many articles. It's like, well, they're not going to fire Ryan Day, but he's not the he's not the solution. So what do you do now? Forty five and five, man. But that's what you get when you take that job. You know, it's the greatest thing in the world. If I had the Ohio State job, I could go out and recruit a top five recruiting class barely without trying. Um, and I could also feel the team that goes 10 into 11, one in every year, but that's not what they want. They want what urban Meyer did in 2014, win a national championship. They want what Jim Trestle did before that. Um, so the, the, the bar is high. He's not reaching it. Uh, and he's in a little bit of trouble because of that. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because he's probably never going to lose more than one or two games in a year. And it's like, how would you ever fire? There's going to be zero justification to firing him. But if he, I guess if he lost like three, four, five Michigans in a row, then then you then you'd have a problem. Three. Like if he, he loses three. next year. He lost that's, three. that's at all in Ann Arbor. If he loses that game next year, I don't care if they're undefeated, because it's always the last game of the season. I don't care if they're undefeated. I don't care if Michigan's not in play for the East title. If he loses that game, and even if he goes on to the Big Ten title game, wins the Big Ten, even if he goes to the playoff, people aren't going to be happy because they want to beat Michigan, period. So he loses three in a row to Michigan. You're going to talk about a guy who may be in the playoff next year uh, being on the hot seat because now people want Vrabel. They want Vrabel to leave Tennessee because <clears throat> he's done got such a great job coaching there, amazing job. Come to Ohio State. Let's get rid of Ryan Day. We want one of our own who's a great coach. It's just – it's amazing how quickly you fall out of favor. Had they won that football game – like we all expected him to, we would probably be talking about 45 and or 46 and four Ryan Day as one of the best coaches in America looking to get an extension and maybe be the highest paid coach in college football. And instead, we're talking about a dude who's like not on a hot seat, but 
the seat is uncomfortable now. It's so interesting. It, it, it is wild to think that way. And the stuff that Harbaugh said sticks. Like people now think, is he it, was he born on third base? You know, type of thing. And like it's like people repeating it over and over again because now that he he's lost, they actually look back and say, ah, oh, is this still is this still the 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 benefits of Trestle plus Urban Meyer now translated into twenty years of winning passed off? It's very very interesting. I mean, obviously Ryan Day is an excellent coach. But there are some things he's got to get fixed. And to me, he's such an offensive guy. And th this is what I I'm waiting for. I think he will win a national championship when he decides to become the CEO that he needs to be of Ohio State and get somebody in that can play call or, or train somebody to play call the way that he does and looks at it the way he does so he could shore up the thing that he needs to shore up, which is the defense. Now. There are plenty of guys, like obviously Mike Leach always calls his plays, right, at, at Mississippi State. But he's not hes not going to win. You know, his system's always going to win eight, nine games. He's never going to win championships unless somehow he got, he'll got he never get the top, top job. If he did, maybe that would be different. I always think about what he said, what changed him from at Texas Tech to the, a really good program where they had the chance to win everything – was when he got the defensive coordinator. I can't think of the guy's name. He's a famous guy. But when he uh, he was their head coach for a while after he left. When he got the defensive coordinator, he finally was able to stop teams that could win big games. And Ryan Day, even though he's such an offensive heavy guy, has to start looking at his program, and he has to say to himself, I've got to figure this out, what I really need myself, not just listen to what everybody else tells me, but figure out, well, what do we really need on defense? His solution has been, let me just go hire a guy that's known as a really good defensive guy. He's got to understand what he has. And I think that when he does that, if he, if he, doesn't, if he wants to be Michigan, he's going to have to do that. If he wants to be national champion, he's going to have to do that. And I think he will. I, I, he's a very, very smart guy. Um, you know, he knows all of football. He, he was a quarterback at UNH with, under Chip Kelly, and he's been an offensive mind. But he's, he knows all of football, and just talking to him, he certainly knows. Um, I don't know if he's going to get rid of Knowles. I don't know what he's going to do with his staff. Um, I think he'll figure it out. But, you know, this was a revenge game in everybody's mind with Ohio State. You know, we got a better team than Michigan this year. Um, but it turns out Michigan has a better team than they did last year, and they're more dangerous than I even thought they would be. Um, and, and that's what's upsetting to Ohio State fans. This was supposed to be a revenge. So now, they, they, you know, being a diehard fan of, let's say you're a diehard fan of Ohio State, you know, and, and I've been a diehard fan of programs before. Well, one, you know, when I was younger, it used to affect me the whole year because – I couldn't stand. And with social media now, it's 20 times worse than it ever was. Ohio State fans are going to have to listen to Michigan fans for another year. A year of this. You know, Michigan could go off to the playoff and get drilled again. It doesn't matter. We beat you. Uh, it could be June. You know, uh, their starting quarterback could go out with an with a ACL in the spring. Anything bad that happens to Michigan doesn't matter. We still beat you. And that's what really sticks with Ohio State fans. They have to listen to this crap for another year. And this last year was long enough. They haven't lost to this team in a long time. But now back to back, they're going to have to listen to it for two years. That's why they all want them gone. That's why they're upset about it. Because there's such a hatred for Michigan from an Ohio State perspective that now they got to let this team talk down to them for a year. So the best thing that could happen to Ohio State is they sneak in the playoff. Uh, both Michigan and Ohio State win their opener games and play, they play for the national championship. But that's not going to happen. So I don't know. It's interesting. You know, I wish him well. I, I hope he figures it out. I'm sure he will. Uh, but it's not fun being Ryan Day right now. And in his, his, in his personality, you know, he was asked, do you guys, should you guys still be a playoff team? And Kevin Warren, the Big Ten commissioner, said absolutely they should. 
Now, me, they've got a win over Notre Dame, who turned out to be good, but wasn't good at the beginning of the season when they beat them. You got a win over Penn State. Penn State's meh. Uh, do they belong and deserve in there? Not over USC, certainly not over TCU, even if TCU loses to me. Um, but Ryan Day answered it. He goes, we, we would be dangerous. But he never answered yes or no. And I know what his answer in his head is. We don't freaking deserve to be in there. This is crap. You know, we lost to Michigan and we lost our undefeated season. We don't belong in there. And that's right. how he feels. He takes things like that. So I do like the way he's going to handle it. He'll be fine. <clears throat> it would be nice. I mean, I know he's not going to watch this, but no. <laughs> for, for Christ's sake, you know, listen, you, you want people behind you. You got to treat them properly. And now all the media is turning against you, you know, and now I don't want to hear from them. Don't text me when you're down. Don't come to me now. You know, I want to hear from people when they're up on their top. And I want to say, hey, congratulations, man. How cool is it that you're the highest state head coach? Whatever. No, yep, that's let's wrap this up. We're one on one twelve. Yeah, it, it was great. We actually went longer than I thought we were on those topics. Uh, well, you know, to, to me, it's uh, make sure you guys check out myfootballcamps.com. Listen, don't if you're 2024. Don't wait. If you're a transfer portal guy, we'll have this up later today. Don't wait, and and we'll rely on uh, uh, transfer Jesus to to help us get 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 the word out over there. Well, and Coach Manis too. I mean, Coach Manis Coach is Manis. our closer. Um, yep. He's the guy. <clears throat> you know, we 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 hand it over to him after initial discussions on the high school kids, and he closes. And we'll do the same thing for the portal. Uh, I'm going to talk to him tomorrow about it, but. The portal kids that I talk to, you know, the first thing I'm going to tell them up front, it's not free. Nothing in life is. And if you're not interested in paying, just say now. Great. But if you are interested in hearing what it's about, um, it's certainly affordable and worth your time. And then we're going to hand it over to the closer. So we got portal Jesus and we got the closer. Um, things are, you know, going great. Yeah, absolutely. No doubt about it. All right. Well, we'll, we'll get off the, the show. We'll see you next time. Um, and obviously, as the season continues to build to a crescendo, there's going to be more and more exciting things. Till next time, uh, Coach Schumann and my man Mike Farrell, we'll see you soon. <laughs>